Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Let's get a bit more now on the reaction to Tony Blair's appeal to the British public. I'll find the right camera. There we go. To change their minds on Brexit. Who benefits from Mr Blair's intervention? What might he achieve? And why has he thrown his voice into the debate today? Well, here's the Independence Chief Political Commentator, John Rentoul, and Liam Young, who writes for the New Statesman. Gentlemen, a very good afternoon to both of you. Uh, John, if I can start with you. Uh, the phrase that leapt out... Uh, from his speech to me, maybe it caught your ear too, was this idea that it was time to rise up. I mean, there was a whiff of students' unionism activism in that, uh, and a bit of melodrama too. <laughs> well, I think he was, he was suggesting that the people who passionately believe, like uh, as he does, that, we, that our best interests uh, lie in remaining in the EU, uh, need to develop a bit more self-confidence about making their arguments. And I think... Uh, he showed how you could do that uh, today, uh, pushed back very strongly on the idea that it's somehow undemocratic to continue to have a debate uh, about the EU uh, even after the referendum. Uh, and he actually examined some of the arguments more closely um, about whether Brexit would actually uh, lead to a significant uh, reduction in immigration, for example. And I thought those were all uh, very important points. Mm. Liam, what did you make of it as a speech? I mean, there was the grand historical sweep there. You always get that from, from Tony Blair. And was, was it, a, it was a coherent argument, clearly. Who is it for? Yeah, well, I think uh, anyone on the left uh, and anybody in the Labour Party can't really uh, disagree with much of the contents of Blair's speech. We all want to oppose a hard Brexit, the economic turmoil that it presents, and to oppose the rise of uh, racism and the, the hard right in this country. But I'm confused not, not as to all, why Tony Blair all has... Supporters. There was quite a high proportion of Labour voters who actually voted for Brexit. There's a high proportion of Labour voters who voted for Brexit, but I think it's wrong to suggest that Labour voters supported Brexit um, uh, out of racist means. I mean, a lot of people I know supported the left-wing arguments for Brexit. I voted Remain personally, but that's mm. a personal opinion. But my confusion over Tony Blair's speech is why he's made it today. I think that it was actually quite reckless um, that he has. Labour faces two crucial by-election contests in less than a week's time in areas where the majority of people voted to leave. And at a time when the far right is rampant and on the rise, we didn't need this grandstanding from Tony Blair. OK, uh, John, let's since Liam introduced the topic, let's talk about the timing. I mean, on one level, it struck me as odd looking, uh, looking at it in the diary today and thinking, well, if you were going to make an intervention that was based on this idea that, that it's not irrevocable, that you can stop it, then the obvious time to have made that keynote speech would have been before the Article 50 vote. Well, that vote's happened now, so Liam's got to be right. You know, Tony Blair didn't just put a pin in the, in the calendar and come up with today, did he? He thought about it. He knows why he's doing it. Well, I mean, Tony Blair has been making these arguments for quite a long time. I mean, during the referendum campaign as well and, and since. But no, his, his, his argument is not about what we need to do now. He's pre he wants to prepare the ground for the next two years, the period of negotiation of the terms of our departure from, from the EU. And I think, um, uh, I, I think that's quite important that, uh, that, that he does that. And he's making a useful contribution to the debate. I mean, I don't think, uh, I don't think the two by-elections uh, matter particularly uh, in, in, that larger, in that larger picture, although it is a paradox that, uh, you know, most of the Labour Party members who voted for Jeremy Corbyn to be leader uh, are supporters of uh, remaining in the EU and would desperately like Jeremy Corbyn to be making the arguments that Tony Blair made today. Yeah, but he's not, though, is he? And, and Tony, go on, Liam. But Tony Blair is an extremely savvy politician. I don't support all of Tony Blair's policies or his positions, but he's a media man. He knows how to manage the media. Today's speech was no mistake. It was made with those ideas uh, in scope. He knows that these by-elections are coming up, and he's made a speech that is truly reckless, because uh, so, Liam, are you the saying threat he... in Stoke yeah, is... I, yeah, are you saying he's doing it to destabilise the party, as you say, this critical time, with a view to setting up an alternative? 
Well, perhaps I'm cynical, but I just don't believe that a man so savvy with the media has made this speech today without reason. Because all I can see is it's a bit of a pointless speech on Brexit. The Article 50 vote has happened. And what change is Tony Blair going to effect in making a position that we're already well aware of made once more? John, our correspondent in the, in the Q&A session that followed the Tony Blair speech said that quite, quite bluntly, is this about a pitch? Is this your SDP moment? Are you going to try and gather together the forces of uh, Europhile centrism and they're going to coalesce around you? He dodged the question. But he's a relative... No, no, he said no. <laughs> <laughs> he said well... no, he's, he's not planning to set up a new political party. I mean, I think that he couldn't have been clearer about that. Mm. And I think the idea that, you know, this is some kind of deliberate act of sabotage for the... Uh, for the by-elections that are coming up is, uh, it, it isn't uh, sustainable. Well, John, he said, uh, he's setting up a movement. he said he's setting up a movement. I mean, you know, I mean, OK, that's not a full-blown party, but it's a halfway house, isn't it? Well, if you believe that, um, you know, our relationship with Europe is, is one of the most important uh, questions in politics, then it makes sense to try and mobilise mobilize people around that. I mean, whether he'll be effective or not is, 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 is another question completely. I mean, I suspect that, you know, there are not that many people who, who want to listen to him because, uh, you know, many of the people who agree with him uh, actually voted for Jeremy Corbyn to be leader of the Labour Party. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn is, is possibly even more responsible than Tony Blair for the, uh, for the result of uh, last year's referendum. Uh, Liam, there was, a, there was always a moment when he taunted the, I think the phrase he used was the cartel of the right-wing press, who he presumed were going to give him a good kicking come tomorrow morning. Uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see whether they do. They may, you know, the Mail and others may decide actually that he's now an irrelevance and therefore the, the best way of dealing with him is to actually ignore him. It may be, and I'd be interested to know what you think, it may be that they feel he's such a... Uh, a figure who's loathed in certain parts of the electorate, uh, that they'll, they'll love piling in. What's your sense? I think that's certainly a very strong point. I mean, they say that Jeremy Corbyn's unpopular, but the series of polls continue to suggest that Tony Blair is even more unpopular, which is why I think it comes back to this point of the by-elections. Blair isn't stupid. He knows that the Blair brand is now fairly toxic. And for him to be calling on people to rise up in this sort of protest movement after opposing the politics of protest his entire life is rather humorous. I mean, this is a man who dismissed the largest protest in British history against his invasion of the Iraq, Iraq war as pointless. So I don't understand why he's now ready to leave this protest movement against a democratic vote. Uh, John, it's always interesting when certain, certain things that have passed into fact, <laughs> to, to use that word right now, are challenged by somebody who was really there. So, for instance, you know, there's, there's this narrative that's developed that, that says Brexit was, you know, the godfather of Brexit to some degree was Tony Blair because of the accession, the rules on accession back in 2004. Home Office at the time had a study, 12,000 people coming from Eastern Europe, it ended up being hundreds of thousands. Ergo, it's his fault. And he said, actually, you know, it yeah. wasn't like that at all. Yeah, no, he was he was quite strong in uh, in defending himself against that one, and uh, and and actually had a had a sort of uh, a, a little underhand uh, hit at uh, Theresa May for uh, suggesting that uh, you know it was all the fault of uh, of, of her predecessors. Um, I you know I mean you could you can you can make these arguments uh, either way. I mean either Tony Blair was responsible for the. For, for the Brexit vote uh, by, uh, by allowing too much immigration, or Jeremy Corbyn was responsible for, a, for the Brexit vote by uh, campaigning so weakly uh, for us to remain. Um, the problem is, you know, we voted to, we voted to leave, and the, and the people who don't agree with that cannot agree on how best to oppose it. I mean, Tony Blair was very reluctant today to say that he wants a second referendum, but I mean, that must be the implication of, uh, of what he was arguing for mm. uh, in his speech. Liam, at one point he said one reason we need to keep Britain in Europe is because in a multipolar world you've got the United States, and he didn't really say it, but he meant, you know, brackets, dangerous United States right now, and a counterweight to that needs to be Europe. And the counterweight works because the UK is in Europe. But there, there would have been people listening to that thinking, well, hang on, mate, you know, you were the Prime Minister who, who, who wanted to be the bridge between America and the European Union, and actually you ended up crossing that bridge with George W. Bush Iraq, etc., etc. Well, there's a reasonable argument to be made there, and I would say to the former Prime Minister and to his tradition of political thinking that he's now left my generation with a monumental task. We now have the far right in power in America. We have a xenophobic, Islamophobic, arguably racist president. 
uh, campaigning on the points he is. We have the rise of UKIP here, the Brexit vote. We have the rise of Marine Le Pen and the anti-Muslim forces in Europe. And this is the sort of vacuum that has been filled by the politics that was left by Tony Blair. I mean, he spoke in his speech about imperfect knowledge, but I think Sir John Chilcock called it something else. And we need to now move forward from, we need to move on from Tony Blair's form of politics. We need to move on from that grandstanding. And it's time for a new generation, along with those who opposed this cushy consensus at the time, yeah. to take control and to make the fight against Brexit, not Tony Blair and his crew. OK, one final thought. I mean, you know, Liam, some people will contest your, your description of what's going on in America right now and other parts of, of the world. But, yeah, course, OK, yeah. that's another argument, isn't it? Uh, but John, just on the point, I mean, it, there's Liam dismissing out of hand the legacy of, of Tony Blair. But let's, I, I'm sure you won't let us forget that this was a man who, you know, by standards of post-war politics, won three elections, you know, hugely successful, uh, Clearly his legacy is uh, complicated by Iraq, to, to put it mildly, but he still was an election-winning machine. And if you're a Brexiteer, if you're a, Lee, if you're a Remainer, that you're going to welcome him on, him on board, aren't you, surely? Well, I would have thought so. I mean, you know, he was Prime Minister for, for 10 years, and as Liam said, he was very good at politics. I don't know if he was responsible for the rise of uh, Donald Trump, but, I mean, he certainly was influential uh, in in British politics and understands British politics and was making some very important points in his speech today about the way the complex the sheer complexity of, of Brexit and how that's going to absorb all the energies of the British government uh, in such a way as to distract it from all the other important things it wants to do uh, such as uh, dealing with the, the crisis in the NHS and uh, and uh, all the rest of it and I thought those were important arguments and I suspect that all fair-minded people would want to listen to them. John Rental from The Independent, Liam Young from The New Statesman. Gentlemen, thanks both very much. Thanks a lot. I've been